Okay, good morning and good afternoon, I see from some of you, and good evening if we have some of our uh, international friends joining us today. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. I'm Betsy Hill, president of Brainware Learning Company, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, as we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping items. One is that we are recording our session today, so if you need to leave early or if there is a colleague that you would like to share this with afterwards, um, anybody who is registered or um, is attending today will automatically get an email when the recording is ready. And that usually is within 24 hours. So um, by the end of the day tomorrow, for sure, you should be able to see that. Uh, looks like everybody has found the chat window, which is great. That is how we will um, handle questions in addition to sharing with everybody where everybody is from, which is great. It's wonderful to see all of that, um, where everybody in, is in the world. Um, we will offer a certificate of participation for today's for, um, continuing education credit. So if you are, um, I have to stop watching the chat because I see so many people I know and it's great to have you all here. Um, certificate participation, um, if you re requested one when you registered, we will automatically take care of that uh, because we'll pull the attendee list from uh, the session today. If you didn't or you're not sure, you can email one of us and we will be, Karen, maybe you can um, share your email um, address and I will be sharing mine at the end. So um, we will definitely take care of that. Uh, behind the handouts tab, there is a, um, a copy of the slides from today, as well as another handout that you might find helpful. And so if you just click on the handouts tab next to the chat tab, you can download that there. So as we're getting started, I have one other thing I would like to do, which is to find out just a little bit about who we have today. So um, I've launched the poll and just trying to figure out whether we've got educators or clinicians or parents. And I may regret not having thought of another one because it looks like we've got a bunch of other, but um, so far, looks like we've got mostly educators, some parents, about evenly just divided between clinicians and learning specialists. So everybody a chance to weigh in there. Okay, it looks like the responses have sort of settled down. So we're about a little over half educators, not that we're not all educators at the end of the day, of course, and about 11% parents, 16% uh, clinicians and 18% other. So thanks for sharing that. That's very, very helpful. So what we're gonna do now um, is um, get started on our uh, webinar today. I do want to clarify that what we're going to focus on today is are the practical aspects of measuring cognitive skills, particularly in an education context. And I'm not going to get into, uh, nor am I really qualified to get into the scientific aspects of assessment and diagnosis at the level of the neuroscientists are doing this around the world. Uh, but what I do want to do today is to explore with uh, you the important connection between executive functions and um, and how we can assess them and how the assessment of those uh, cognitive processes um, will help us uh, understand why our students may not be performing. Um, and as their teachers and parents, um, we can also then uh, figure out how we can impact, um, how we can provide the support and the cognitive training that can really help them improve their executive functions and their academic performance. So we're gonna talk about um, executive functions uh, with some examples. Those of you who know me know I love examples. And I should have closed that poll, I'll get rid of that. Um, and talk about measurement and assessment then. So as we start, um, there is some debate that continues about how many executive functions there are and exactly what they there are. But there is some uh, stronger consensus these days that these three executive functions are really core 
um, and impact how we learn and we think. So th those three executive functions are working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility. Working memory is our ability to hold information in our minds. It's our conscious processing. It's how we keep information active. Okay. All right. I had um, a dis something disconnected me from my audio stream. Okay. And everybody's telling me that they lost the connection. And hopefully now it's back. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, I just lost my audio connection. So, so sorry about that. Um, so what we were talking about was inhibitory control. I hope that's where everybody left off. And um, we're very aware of this as teachers and parents uh, because it's what we see when we see our kids behaving impulsively or inappropriately. They, they clearly lack that inhibitory control. And like working memory and cognitive flexibility, these all of these are important activities that happen in our frontal lobe. So the front part of our brain, right behind our forehead basically. And that part of our brain doesn't fully mature until we are well into our 20s, according to recent research. But just because our executive functions and that our frontal lobes are not are, are still somewhat immature, that doesn't mean that they're non-existent and that executive functions just can't happen at all. Um, executive functions, as we'll see, can be um, improved at just about any age. And the third is cognitive flexibility. And that's what we need when we transition from one perspective or thought process to another. It's what I had to do when I had to make sh figure out how to reconnect my um, microphone and then go back to um, the presentation when I lost sound a minute ago. Uh, and it's what we do when circumstances around us demand that we change the focus of our attention. This is um, a chart that we use to sort of put these cognitive skills called executive functions into context. And so really what executive functions are is a special class of cognitive skills. Cognitive skills just refers to mental processes. And this sort of summarizes the kinds of mental processes we need to have working efficiently and accurately to be able to learn and think and do what we do. Uh, in this model, we have a set of foundational cognitive skills at the bottom. So these are the basic ways that our brains take in information from the outside world. So they include things like um, some of our attention skills, visual processing, so our ability to Okay, I should be back now. I'm so sorry for that inconvenience. This is unusual for uh, me to learn, lose my sound twice like this. I hope that's not gonna happen again. Um, so I, again, apologies for that. And then what we have in this model is that, um, hopefully everybody can hear me now, can hear you again. Great, thanks so much. Perfect. 
And then what we have, so we have foundational cognitive skills at the bottom, executive functions above that, and higher order executive functions at the very top. And that group of skills, reasoning, problem solving, planning, et cetera, are the kinds of skills that really read a lot like a list of 21st century skills or the skills that employers are looking for today um, in their new hires or the top of a hierarchy like Bloom's. The point here is that those higher order thinking skills, the one that we know are needed um, and that our students really need to develop and we work hard with them to help that happen, depend on them developing their working memory, inhibitory control and cognitive flexibility. We can also extend the model beyond that uh, because what we know is that what we focus on in schools, also English language arts, social and emotional learning, math and other STEM fields um, also depend on these skills and need them to be uh, operating effectively and well. Um, and it turns out that executive functions are also predictive of how well our students will do, um, not just in school, but in their lives. So how far they will get academically, how much money they will make in a lifetime, whether uh, they'll be healthy as adults, whether they'll get into trouble with the law, all of those kinds of things um, are uh, being really predicted by um, executive functions to a very significant degree. So now I want to shift and I want to talk about, make sure that we can connect this directly to the kinds of academic outcomes that we're likely to see. Um, so if you talk about executive functions in reading, um, we're going to, every time that we need to understand something that we're reading, a story, for example, so that we can keep track of the beginning, the middle, and the end, um, and understand that flow, if we need to read a set of instructions and then need to act on them, um, whenever we're reading something and we're, we're comparing it to prior knowledge, which is how we make meaning, so just about any time we're trying to comprehend something, uh, we're going to be using our working memory. Inhibitory control, um, you can think about this from something as basic as whether students can uh, focus their attention on the reading assignment and ignore or screen out what their neighbors are um, saying to each other or what their neighbors are doing or, uh, and then to choosing the appropriate word so that we suppress a word that's not applicable. And then um, refraining from automatic responses. Uh, so we might, uh, that's, we'll talk about a couple examples of that in a minute. And then cognitive flexibility is about our ability to take in information and change direction when we learn new information. So we might Think of this also as understanding and appreciating the points of view of different characters in a story, or something as basic as switching back and forth between decoding and sight words. So here's an example of that. I just want to give everybody a little bit of a feel for it. And this is an exercise that I came up with that I think helps to demonstrate the role of working memory in reading, uh, particularly around decoding. So most of us don't remember not being able to read and what it was like to struggle to decode a word before moving on to the next one. So what I did is create a little experience that um, I hope you find entertaining. And for this exercise, what we're doing is we're going to substitute the Russian alphabet for our familiar uh, English American alphabet. And so when you see an A, that's like an A. When you see a B, it's actually going to make the sound of a V. When you see this next little character on down here, that's a D sound. And so uh, um, what we want to do is we want to see if we can decode a word that is transliterated, that is represented in Russian sounds rather than uh, Russian letters instead of English letter, American English letters. So here is a word at the side that you can see. And this word would be, if we look through the list, you can see that the first letter is a P sound. The second is an E sound. That's at the very bottom of the list of characters. And then the next sound is N. So pen is this word. 
all I've done is transliterate the English word using Russian letters. But if we're not familiar with letters, then this is basically what we have to do. We have to think about each letter, the sound that it makes, and then try to uh, put them together. So we're going to try something a little bit more challenging, in fact, maybe a lot a bit more challenging. And I'll give everybody a moment to work on this. I don't know if we have any buddy who is um, speaks Russian or is familiar with the Russian alphabet, uh, but uh, that may certainly speed things up. But I'm going to let you just uh, try to figure this out. So I'm going to give everybody a moment to think about whether they're, they're able to understand or figure out or sound out what the bottom sentence would be. So if anybody has figured it out, um, that's great. And as you think about how you did that, did you write it down? Or did any, was anybody able to, my brain goes into dyslexia, exactly, that's the whole feeling that you get. So now you have a sense of what it's like when, um, for dyslexics or even just for early beginning readers, uh, because we, you have to think about the sound and then try to put it together. But that sentence says, if we just pronounce it with using the Russian letters, is that decoding puts heavy demands on working memory when not automatic. And um, obviously that's not how you would say it in Russian. We're just using the Russian letters. But the, the issue that kids have, that we all have, Good for you, Yvette, decoding puts. Um, so the sentence is at the very bottom, decoding puts heavy demands on working memory when not automatic, and it does. Um, there just isn't enough working memory to get them through the decoding of words and help them understand at the same time. Um, some other ways uh, that you may not realize um, some of these actually are pretty new to me, uh, which is our ocular motor system. So that's the system that takes in information and controls our eye movements and things like that to efficiently take in information. We actually use both automated and controlled inhibitory signals to regulate uh, what's called saccades, which are how our eyes move and jump to focus on different things. So some of those are automatic um, and some of those are controlled so that we can stop our eyes from moving down a sentence and go back to something that we didn't catch. Um, word guessing in reading, which is something that a lot of dyslexic readers do, um, although they're not the only ones. And what they've done, what they found out in the research on this is that um, so you're reading along and you see a word that you don't know and this child will just sort of blurt out a word that maybe begins with the same letter it looks or as a word that that um, word actually sort of remember uh, resembles. Um, and it turns out that uh, rather than being related, more of that problem is actually related to less efficient suppression or in inhibition of the words that come to mind than it is to excessive reliance on contextual information. So it's not that contextual information isn't going to affect it, but a lot of times uh, it is actually more due to the fact that we can't inhibit those other automatic responses. Um, whenever we're writing or speaking or, um, of course, reading is in that example, we have to inhibit word candidates, things that might come to mind. This is even more so for bilinguals, um, although practicing that as a bilingual actually develops greater inhibitory control than monolinguals in general. And I think that's sort of one of those wonderful things. And I suspect we have a few truly bilingual people on the phone today. So you have an advantage in that. But if you think about um, what happens in a bilingual or dual language speaker's mind, uh, when you are trying to come up with a word, for example, for um, this image that we have here. So in English, we could call it a chair, we could call it a seat, depending on what we're trying to convey. And of course, there are comparable words in Spanish, silla en asiento. And if I'm an English speaker, I still have to suppress one of the words to determine what I want to talk about. Um, and the same is true 
uh, for Spanish speakers, but they may have more word candidates that they actually have to suppress to be able to come up with the correct target language word. Um, but we do this um, to a little bit lesser degree, perhaps, but we do this also as we're learning our own language, particularly when it comes to irregular verbs. Um, so if you think about um, the kinds of grammar mistakes that little kids make um, when they're first learning to use the past tense of, of something. So, you know, yesterday I walked to the store. Uh, yesterday I, um, only irregular verbs are coming to my mind. I uh, talked on the phone yesterday. I visited my grandmother. So we learn the pattern that the end of a past tense verb is the d sound. Um, and therefore, and then we start to apply it to everything. So I go to the store is some, typically the kind of thing that, um, that we um, will hear from little kids until they learn that there actually is an, ex an exception. And what we need to do, especially as we're learning that is we actually have to suppress the goad and then we have to replace it. We have to activate the irregular uh, form of that for went. So now let's talk a little bit about executive functions in math uh, because we have one brain that we do all of this stuff with. Okay. Um, so working memory is, you know, we talked about how it helps us hold in our mind the flow of a story, but it also hold, helps us hold in mind multiple aspects of a math problem. It helps us keep track of where we are in a multi-step solution. Um, inhibitory control. So very often we will have an immediate uh, response to something, uh, the first possible solution to something. But sometimes we need to question our assumptions or we need to consider alternatives or we need to figure out a different approach if our first one uh, doesn't work. And then cognitive flexibility is what allows us to look at problems from different points of view or change direction when we get new information, trying alternatives when that first approach doesn't work. So we're going to do a little exercise again, a little experiment. And what I've done is um, create um, an example of how we use inhibitory control in math. That's also going to show a little bit of how we use working memory. So I'm going to show you an ad for various electronic products. You have $150 to spend. And the question is whether you can afford the TV that you want that is featured in this ad. OK, so here is the ad. And again, the question is, can you afford the TV for $550? So you can go ahead and type your, nope, no TV, yes, okay. We have people coming to different conclusions here. Feel free to type your answer in the chat window, and then I'll know that people have gone through a little bit of the exercise. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, so what's going on in our brains when we have to do this? First, we had to find the TV. Right. So we've got a bunch of competing things. We have that little Google, whatever you call it. And we have a remote control doorbell and we have headphones and all these other very cool things. But we have to focus on the TV. So we have to screen out or inhibit all those other options. The regular price of the TV is one hundred and seventy nine. The sale discount is 20 percent. And of course, there are many ways that you can perform that calculation. <laughs> and um, uh, I didn't say anything about <laughs> tax, but of course, if you live in Illinois, you would definitely have to worry about that because that would certainly come into play. So those of you who said, no, you can't afford it, we're probably <laughs> counting on the fact that you would have to pay tax as well, and it would take you over your 150. And then you have to hold that sale price in mind while you add the tax for some of you or just as you compare it to the 150 and judge whether or not you're gonna be able to afford it. So in this case, assuming 
<laughs> there is no tax or you take your tax exempt form, as Larry points out, you're actually going to be able to afford that TV. Now I want to talk a little bit about executive functions and SEL, social and emotional learning or social and emotional competence. Um, it turns out that reading and math and social situations are all really just specific instances of the exercise of executive functions. So in each one of those, we're interacting with different knowledge sets, but we're still using these core mental processes, whether it's reading or math or science or um, a social interaction. So for example, in um, uh, the social context, when we are speaking with somebody and we need to hold their point of view in mind or we can compare it and contrast it to our own views or we remember what someone just said and as we're talking, we're checking our response to make sure that we're addressing the, the question or the comment that they made. Or when we follow instructions. Um, many of you I'm sure have had experiences where you asked a child to um, do something, you know, please go up and get your um, soccer uniform and uh, don't forget your spelling list and make sure that you've got your snack. Well, uh, keeping track of all of those different um, instructions can be very, very difficult. Inhibitory control, um, really obvious things. And this is, of course, uh, where we see it and are aware of it a lot in at home or in um, a social situation or in a, a classroom situation. Uh, so when we refrain and, and keep ourselves from blowing out the candles on somebody else's birthday cake or not just blurting out, that's stupid uh, when you disagree with somebody or staying on task despite the fact that you'd really rather to go out and um, play um, or screening out other voices when you're at a cocktail party. This is what you do when you have to concentrate and screen out the other voices so that you can focus on the, um, the conversation that you're having. In cognitive flexibility, looking at personal experiences from different points of view, being able to change direction when you get new information, shifting focus and resetting priorities when you something new happens. So that we learn not to grab toys from other children, if nothing else. This is a pretty cute little picture. All right, so when, for many teachers and parents, children's brains are black boxes and we can't look inside their brains to see those frontal lobes at work and figure out if working memory and inhibitory control and cognitive flexibility are working well, or if they're working well, what else is going on? We do, however, now have tools that can be used. And there are lots of tools to assess executive functions. There are tests that are used by neuroscientists in the lab and their research. There are tests that are used by psychologists to evaluate learning disabilities. And there are now assessments that can be used by parents and teachers and others to understand a child's cognitive strengths and weaknesses and how those may be impacting their academic progress. And this is where we're gonna focus our attention for the next uh, rest of the webinar. The difficulty, of course, with most cognitive assessments, as any of you parents and teachers know, is that they can be difficult to administer or require advanced training. Um, often the results are difficult even for teachers to connect to academic struggles and performance and to what you can do about them. And even if you can, it requires quite a bit of time and effort to do that. So we're happy to let you know that there is an exception to that. And it's a uh, tool called MindPrint. It's a cognitive assessment that was developed at the University of Pennsylvania it's been through all of the hoops of scientific validation and norming uh, that would be necessary. So all of that has been reviewed in um, the appropriate academic publications. But as an ad the advantage is that it can be administered online in about an hour by a teacher or a parent, and it's very affordable. Um, it is appropriate for ages eight um, on up. It can actually be used with adults as well, but um, uh, specifically, this is focusing on ages 8 to 21. There are 10 subtests within um, the assessment. And what I've done here is highlight the executive functions assessments. 
In this context, the attention test uh, includes selective attention and inhibitory control. So we're gonna get information on our children's uh, capacity in that area from that test. Flexible thinking is the, will reflect cognitive flexibility and working memory, of course, is working memory. So we're gonna get a real, some real insight into our child's or student's um, executive functions and other cognitive skills. So here is uh, an example of how, what this might look like. What we're looking at here is a particular student's scores as a percentile ranking. So if this child is performing at the 70th percentile, then 70% of the population performed, uh, uh, got a lower score than the student. And so obviously the higher, the more we are to the right, the more effective and the stronger our cognitive skills are uh, when we're over to the left. And the colored bands reflect sort of different um, arenas. So if we're in that purple band on the left, we know that this child is going to have some pretty serious difficulties in that area of cognitive processing. If we're in the blue in the middle, we're gonna be, that's in the expected range, right in the middle of what we expect. And so they're probably gonna be performing um, pretty much as we would expect them to in, um, in school and in the rest of their lives. And if they're really at the high end in that top 5%, then we're gonna say something like um, they're gifted or they have an exceptional strength in that area. So what this allows to do, you can see for this student that um, nothing is showing up for working memory and for verbal reasoning and visual memory is in that exceptional weakness arena. So think about what it would be like for a student with scores in that bottom 5% to read and write. Bottom 5% working memory and particularly verbal reasoning, which we also know is gonna be important for reading. So the important thing to understand here is that there can be non-instructional reasons, that is underlying cognitive skill reasons that have nothing to do with the teacher's skills or the curriculum or the, the rest of those things for this student to be struggling in reading. And in fact, the mindfulness system correlates cognitive skills with academic performance and makes predictions on where students will struggle. So these are the predictions for the same student we just looked at. The red means a struggle. The green box means it'll be a strength uh, and they have the underlying scores, uh, uh, skills to perform very well. And the beige means that they're in the expected range. Note that these are predictions, not the result of reading and math assessments, uh, but what they do is look at those underlying skills. And we can co then compare these predictions to the student's actual reading and math scores and understand that the solution to the student's struggles is probably not more practice reading aloud, okay? The student can read fluently, but when it comes to comprehension, which is that second box, you can just see reading, it would say reading comprehension or vocabulary, that's not something that just more reading out loud is necessarily gonna help their underlying cognitive reasons for doing, for the issues that the student is experiencing. So once we understand that, and we understand and have a grasp of the student's cognitive profile, including their executive functions, we have a couple of options. First of all, we can work around them. So for example, uh, if a student has weaker working memory, we can encourage them to create a written checklist of steps to help them keep track of where they are in um, a set of instructions or in a math problem. Uh, if inhibitory control is an issue, uh, removing distractions is going to be helpful. So uh, making sure that they're in an environment where the fewest possible instructions are uh, stressing their, their uh, ability to keep track of things. Or rephrasing questions. So rather than saying, what is the answer to this problem? If you have a child uh, with, uh, that struggles some with um, cognitive flexibility, you might instead say, what are different ways you could approach this problem? Um, the first is gonna trigger, what is the answer to this problem is probably gonna trigger a specific response without considering different ways to approach it. So they'll choose the default way of approaching that problem 
and not necessarily think about different ways. So that's one approach. And this can be very helpful in terms of um, helping students uh, manage their academic tasks. The other side, though, is that we can actually work on developing or strengthening those underlying skills. And the research is starting to show that how this can be done. So I'm going to talk about a couple of, of ways uh, that the research is supporting. One is for young children. The other is for elementary and up. So I copied this slide and the next one um, from a presentation by Adele Diamond, who's one of the world's leading researchers on executive functions and also connected them very in very practical ways to what schools and parents can do. She's at the v University of British Columbia, and I know we have someone from BC here, so this is your, um, uh, if you have, haven't ever encountered Adele, I hope you will do so. She is a, just a fabulous person and a really outstanding researcher. So based on her research and consistent with the work of Lev Vygotsky, programs like Tools of the Mind have been shown uh, to improve children's executive functions. And what this involves is using make-believe play as a major mechanism for actually developing self-regulation in preschoolers. So remember we talked about how our frontal lobes don't develop till later, but there's no reason that young children cannot start to develop these skills. So pl while play may seem like, well, child's play, it is far more serious than that. So for example, I watch my four-year-old granddaughter pretending to be the heroine of one of her favorite books, books, The Princess in Black. And it's fascinating to me to see how she's able to adapt to the plot twists her father and I throw at her from time to time as we're acting out and being different characters. So in social play, pretend play, children have to hold their own role and those of others in mind. So that is exercising working memory. Uh, when they're pretending to be a character, that character may not respond um, in the same way as I might as a child. So I have to use my inhibitory control and I have to adjust as twists and turns in the plot come up. So th this is a great way to actually exercise and practice executive functions. In fact, I remember that my, um, even in, in middle school, um, the boys in my class used to um, take on the roles of, of the Hobbit. And so they were different characters and, and that would, um, I don't think they were really acting out play all the time, but Nonetheless, they had sort of adopted these characters, and I and I think that is um, something that can be useful, maybe even for somewhat older children than preschoolers. Another approach that also addresses cognitive skills and has been shown to be both enjoyable and beneficial for kids and adults uh, beyond preschool years is uh, a form of play, uh, which is cognitive training, but in the form of a video game. And so many of you uh, may be aware of Brainware Safari. It's a software program that comes from clinical therapy, but is integrated into a digital game-based format. And uh, this has uh, been used in a variety of school and home situations uh, with some pretty uh, dramatic improvements in some of these underlying skills. So now what we're doing is we're going back and we're looking at that student that we saw before. So remember that uh, there were, was very, very low in working memory, very low in verbal reasoning, also very low in visual memory, and the kind of impacts that that would have for um, the student's performance in an academic setting and probably also in the rest of her life. So what we're looking at now is, not, is both the pretest at top gray bar and the post-test results, the, the black bar underneath it. So following 12 weeks of cognitive training, this student performed in the expected range in all of the areas of the test, of the mind print test, with the exception of verbal reasoning. And you can see that verbal reasoning, which was not even on the chart at the beginning, is now in that um, support range. Um, so she's still going to need to have some support in terms of verbal reasoning. Um, which also the mind print system will provide. But her executive functions now, particularly attention, working memory, and flexible thinking, are going to help her be 
um, much more successful without intensive support in those areas. And now we know where to focus our attention uh, to enable her to be successful because we really understand. Now, this that was one particular um, student I want to share also uh, data. This is a group of 50 students selected from third, fourth, and fifth grade classes because by their teachers because they were struggling academically. And so you're seeing all the tests across the bottom, the percentile rankings on the y-axis and the pre and the post test in the um, light blue and darker blue bar. So you can see the kinds of gains that these students were able to make on average across the board. And of course, there's a lot of individual differences depending on um, their cognitive profile. But on average, 21 percentile points improvement across all of these um, 10 test areas. And I'm gonna talk about longitudinal in just a minute. So I see those questions popping up. Um, so the students I showed you um, up until now have been not classified as special ed, uh, but obviously that's a particular interest because we know that so many students uh, with learning disabilities or, um, and, uh, are actually have some underlying issues in executive functions and other cognitive areas. Um, so the, the students that we've looked at um, up until now have not been classified as special ed with the exception that one student in that last group qualified during the course of the program. But what you're seeing here is uh, research with a group of students with specific learning disabilities. That's what SLD stands for. And uh, the test here was not mind print, it was actually the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive battery. And so we're looking at the results from the subtest areas. We're looking at a control group, that is a group that did not do cognitive training with brainware, and a, a study group that actually did cognitive training with brainware. The um, normally developing uh, benchmark for these is 90, a score of 90. So the scores that are below that, you can see, for example, that in verbal working memory, these students, the control group was performing at 46, it's a proficiency index, and the um, study group is a little bit higher, but not meaningfully, was performing at 54% proficiency on the pretest. But on the post-test, we're getting them up pretty much across the board to the level that would be considered normally developing. Uh, and you can see that that's true for working memory. You can see it's true for attention. You can see it's uh, getting pretty close to that with for the overall executive functions um, summary uh, group of tests. And then the question uh, is, of course, whether this has an impact on academics. And we see that as well. So this, the cognitive um, bars here on the left-hand side just summarize that cognitive, detailed cognitive information that I showed you. And here are tests of reading and math. These are reading fluency, passage comprehension, math fluency, those kinds of things. And you can see the dramatic gains that the students who did cognitive training were able to achieve. Again, these are over the course of 12 weeks and it was eight tenths of a grade equivalent in reading and a full grade equivalent in math. So another way to underscore the fact that um, these skills are actually directly involved in reading and math in ways that we haven't always necessarily appreciated. So the last question is, what about social and emotional intelligence? Um, not often measured in schools. Um, I think that's going to be happening more and more. But parents and teachers uh, frequently observe that and want to know what to do about it. Um, here are some of the kinds of observations that teachers and parents have following um, the use of um, any kind of ways of improving kind of training, whether it's that play kind of uh, approach for the younger students or um, effective cognitive um, training by a clinician or with brainware or something that has been demonstrated to be effective. So, um, and these are the kinds of things that are pretty easy for teachers and parents to observe. So um, a child who seems to be able to focus better, to settle down to their homework a little bit better, um, less resistance maybe to doing their homework, um, 
um, able to get their work done faster. Um, sometimes you've got good students, but it just takes them so long to do their homework. Uh, less frustration. So they're going to be challenged and they may be frustrated from time to time when they're doing cognitive training or other kinds of cognitive development. But then they're going to be um, consistent with the whole concept of growth mindset. Once you understand that that's part of the learning process and parts of developing your skills, you will then be typically less frustrated with difficult tasks. So let's go back. Oh, before we do that, I do want to um, start to talk a little bit about those. Um, the question about whether these are sh uh, short term or long term um, effects. So the data on long term is limited, but so far it's very, very encouraging. Uh, what we have seen in the research that we have done with Brainware is that the skills are sustained or even continue to improve at an accelerated rate following use of the program with testing that's been done um, three months, six months, and um, some anecdotal evidence from a year later. Uh, we are working now on uh, being able to look at data after you know a year and more um, obviously, it's not always easy to track kids and to get them to come back to do testing um, later, but it's a very important question. And this is what we would expect, because what we're doing when we're developing these skills is that we're strengthening the parts of the brain, the neural connections that actually execute these processes so that they're just there. So, um, and when, as long as you're using them, the brain, of course, is use it or lose it. As long as we're using them, which we typically are when we're in an academic setting, uh, we typically do that when we're in a work setting. We typically do that when we're in a social setting. So we're actually using our working memory. We're using our inhibitory control. We're using our cognitive flexibility. As long as we continue to practice them, uh, we should they should be there. Just the same way as that you've never forgotten how to walk. You've never forgotten uh, how to ride a bike if you learn to ride a bike. You may be a little rusty when you go back to doing it, but those brain processes, once you practice something over and over and over again, um, it's something that you can do non-consciously. Think about when you learn to drive a car and today you drove your car without thinking about where the brake and where the turn signal were, uh, where the key goes into the ignition, unless you're in a rental car, which you may have to use your cognitive flexibility to adapt to, um, but otherwise, those skills are simply there and you don't have to think about them consciously. So that is why we would expect these um, effects to be um, sustained over a period of time and, um, you know, why they we uh, we are excited about seeing um, further data on that. So um, we have time for some questions now. Some additional questions if I can make this slide go. Oops. Okay, now it's going to do that. Um, I also know that some of you um, may be interested in um, further conversations. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to create, use this pop up thing. I used this the last time and it seemed to be, um, I'm going to send this. Okay. Um, so there's a little pop-up thing. If you are interested in having some further conversation about executive functions and the approaches that we've been talking about today, um, if you provide your contact information using that little, just click on that little Your Contact Info button, we will be happy to follow up with you. Um, okay, so let me now go back and see if I can address some additional are there questions about the handouts? So the handouts are available um, in the handouts tab. They are one slide per page. I thought I saw that somebody else wanted a different version. So I will go back through the, um, and I will also include a link to them in the follow-up email from this, uh, from our webinar today so that everybody can get them if you have difficulty downloading or whatever, don't worry about it. There, are, We have about a million ways to get it to you and we will use 
every last one of them if we need to. Um, okay. All right, looking for more questions. Oh, Tara. Hi, Tara. Um, Brainware has um, has been used with older adults, but we do not at this point have um, research to so that we can um, quantify or be specific about the kinds of impacts. So it's all anecdotal. Um, I will say that there's so much discussion around about um, Alzheimer's and mild cognitive decline and, uh, you know, age-related cognitive decline and things like that. So uh, the research, um, and again, I'm not an Alzheimer's researcher, but as I've read the research, what we're seeing is that um, Alzheimer's is not really amenable to um, a lot of prevention or change once it's started. Um, there certainly seems to be general agreement in the scientific community that there are tactics and strategies that we can use um, while we're younger and before we um, get to the point where Alzheimer's is diagnosed, where we can um, continue to build our cognitive reserve is the, the term that's often used. So we can build our cognitive strengths, we can build our cognitive skills, we can continue actually to build those executive functions and improve them even as adults. Um, but if there is somebody in the, um, in the webinar today who does work with adults and is interested in uh, doing research in that area, uh, we would be delighted to talk to you about that. Um, credentials to administer the assessment, uh, you, they can be administered by a parent, by a teacher, um, even taken independently by an older, um, you know, someone in their teens or um, above that. Da, 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 da. You know, Marcy, about the broad attention on the Woodcock Johnson, I'm gonna to have to check on that because that was Dr. Sarah Afson's research. Um, and I will, um, I will email and ask her about that and ask her to clarify that. Rachel, children three to five. So we talked about the um, structured play, role playing and things like that, which can be very beneficial for young children. There's also another program that um, you might want to know about called Ramps to Reading, which is a program that develops a combination of early reading and pre-reading skills along with some cognitive skills. And um, we can certainly uh, just email us or just put a note in the chat window if that's something that you would like to do. All right, keeping an eye on the time as well. Um, in, uh, Angelina's asking about um, students with ADHD. Um, and whether they were included in the study on specific learning disabilities. So they were not specifically excluded or included. Um, in most of our research, there are children with ADHD diagnoses, um, simply because there are so many of them and um, around. And so uh, we did a small study with ADHD kids um, are looking to do more work specifically that with, with that population, because if you look at the profile of those students, um, students with attention deficit disorder typically have very weak working memory, weaker, uh, certainly attention, particularly selective attention. It's the screening out of um, stimuli that is difficult for them, as well as cognitive flexibility. And cognitive flexibility can be a major issue also in autism. Um, so not a, as direct an answer as I'd like to be able to provide, but, um, uh, there certainly have been, uh, has been work with students with ADHD. So just want to be clear, um, I don't know of anything, including brainware that cures ADHD, um, but we certainly do believe that we can help 
students develop stronger attention, stronger working memory, and stronger cognitive flexibility, as well as other cognitive processes that they need to rely on for learning and thinking um, wherever they, pretty much wherever they are on the spectrum of um, abilities. Um, Uh, for high school students, um, brainware can be used, as we said, for ages six to 106. So uh, we have done some work uh, with high school students, some work with college uh, students in a community college, as well as some workforce development. So the principles and the techniques that are used to develop these kinds of skills are pretty much applicable at just about any age. Um, timing of the recording and the certificate. So the recording should be processed within 24 hours of when we end the webinar. Um, there will automatically be an email that goes out to notify you when the recording is ready. And um, in terms of the certificate, um, it usually takes us um, a few days, maybe even a week, depending on the number of attendees because each of them has to be created. Um, but so if you don't see your certificate, I would, it was Thursday, say by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, just drop us an email and, um, we'll sometimes, I would also say before you do that, check your spam folder. Um, uh, a lot of my emails for whatever reason have been ending up in people's spam folders in the last, um, in the last little while. Processing speed. Um, have we seen improvements in processing speeds? Processing speed is a very difficult, it's very difficult to impact, but we have seen some improvements. And frankly, even a little bit of improvement in processing speed can often be very, very helpful. Um, oh, Fred, thanks for letting me know about it. I will, uh, about Adele's current work with uh, an iPad study. That'd be interesting. Um, diet is also an important thing, of course. You know, there are the things that have been shown to have an impact. Um, certainly, uh, diet is one. The impact of poverty on cognitive uh, development is also well documented. Um, Sleep has a big impact on cognitive development and cognitive functioning. Uh, so there are lots of things um, that can have um, an impact. The assessment takes, it just, we're obviously bouncing around a lot, but that's how the questions are appearing. So the, the MindPrint assessment takes about an hour um, to administer. Um, and Roxanne, I'm not sure whether um, about the WISC definition of processing speed. I'm not aware of work that has been done using WISC, although some of our clinicians, I believe, use WISC. And um, we can certainly check with them just to see if they have any insights or if you would like to do a trial to, um, to um, see whether you can see an impact. We'd be happy to work with you on that. Um, Okay. Okay, great comment, Dave, about the fact that we can actually now screen students and figure out uh, ways to, um, to help them. Uh, there's a question about um, neuroplasticity exercises used by Aerosmith. So Aerosmith is a school um, that uses um, neuroplasticity exercises or cognitive training exercises um, within the school environment, not in an, uh, to my knowledge, not computer-based, um, although there may be an aspect to that. And typically they see some really nice improvements over the course of two or three years. Um, so, what we know is that we can actually have um, an impact in, in less time than that. Um, although I'm sure that we, as we've seen the, the, um, the, the research on that program is that it can be very effective. 
Right. So any other questions? We're just about we got one minute left. Uh, and I want to respect everybody's time. So just checking. Oh, uh, studies about kids with auditory processing issues. Um, so BrainWare is not designed, um, to, neither is MindPrint for that matter, to assess or train auditory processing issues. Um, so we would not expect um, that to have an impact. There are programs that deal specifically with central auditory processing issues, um, things like Fast for Word or aerobics uh, and there, there are others that actually um, are effective in addressing those, but that is, you would want to look toward that kind of um, a resource for help in that area. So let me just, um, as we're wrapping up, um, say how much I'd like to say connected with all of you. Um, really enjoyed, um, this is a, an area of work that um, we see having just such a tremendous impact for kids and are really excited to share this with you. Um, we look forward to other conversations and continuing the discussion. So feel free to connect with me or to email me or to call me. If you have, um, uh, it, again, if you want to um, get a certificate or whatever, you can do that and email us and we will be happy to add you to the list. So thank you all so much for your time today. Time is our most precious commodity and we really, um, are grateful for you sharing it with us. And um, we will look forward to further conversations and hope that you'll we'll see you in another webinar sometime soon. So take care and have a great rest of your week.